Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Medisodes. This week we're going to follow up on Medisodes episode 32 where we talked about the importance of sleep by focusing on sleep disorders. Sleep disorders are also known as somnopathies and is an umbrella term for a group of medical conditions that interrupt a person's regular sleep pattern. Some sleep disorders are serious enough to interfere with normal physical and mental functioning. Under this umbrella term, sleep disorders are broadly classified into dysomnias, parasomnias and circadian rhythm sleep disorders and other disorders. Dysomnias refer to sleep disorders that mean the patient struggles to get to sleep, remain asleep or suffers from excessive sleepiness. Parasomnias refer to sleep disorders that are characterised by abnormal movements, emotions and dreams during sleep. Circadian rhythm sleep disorders are sleep disorders involving the timing of sleep and the abnormalities in the different stages of sleep. In our earlier episode covering the importance of sleep, we discussed the stages of sleep in much more detail, so be sure to check that out for more information. So to start off with, I'll talk about insomnia and it is arguably the most common and well-known sleep disorder. Insomnia is also known as sleeplessness and is characterised by trouble sleeping. Patients may have difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep as long as desired or required. Insomnia is typically followed by daytime sleepiness, low energy, irritability and a depressed mood. And it may result in increased risk of vehicle collisions as well as problems focusing and learning. Insomnia can be short term, lasting for days or weeks, or long term, lasting for more than a month. Insomnia can occur independently or as a result of another problem. Conditions that can cause or result in insomnia include psychological stress, chronic pain, heart failure, hypothyroidism, heartburn, restless leg syndrome, menopause, and certain medications and drugs such as caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol. Other risk factors include working night shifts and sleep apnea, the latter of which Shrey will discuss later on in the episode. Diagnosis of insomnia is based on sleep habits and an examination to look for underlying causes. A sleep study may be done to look for underlying sleep disorders. Screening may be done with two questions. Do you experience difficulty sleeping and do you have difficulty falling or staying asleep? Between 10 and 30% of adults have insomnia at any given point in time, and up to half of people have insomnia in a given year. About 6% of people have insomnia that is not due to a problem that lasts for more than a month. People over the age of 65 are affected more often than younger people, and females are affected more often than males. Key symptoms of insomnia include difficulty falling asleep, including difficulty finding a comfortable sleeping position, waking up during the night and being able to return to sleep and waking up early, not being able to focus on daily tasks, difficulty in remembering stuff, daytime sleepiness, irritability, depression and anxiety, feeling tired or having low energy during the day, trouble concentrating and being unnecessarily aggressive or impulsive. Sleep onset insomnia is difficulty falling asleep at the beginning of the night and is often a symptom of anxiety and disorders. Delayed sleep phase disorder can be misdiagnosed as insomnia, as well as sleep onset is delayed to much later than normal, whilst awaking spills over daylight hours. It's common for patients who have difficulty falling asleep to have nocturnal awakenings with difficulty returning to sleep. Two thirds of these patients wake up in the middle of the night, with more than half having trouble being falling back to sleep after a middle of the night awakening. Early morning awakening is an awakening occurring earlier than desired, with an inability to go back to sleep, and before total sleep time reaches six and a half hours. Early morning awakening is also associated with depression. Some cases of insomnia are really not really insomnia in the traditional sense, because people experiencing sleep state misperception often sleep for the normal amount of time. The problem is that despite sleeping for multiple hours each night, and typically not spending significant daytime sleepy, they do not feel like they have slept very much at all. Because of their subjectivity, they underestimate how long they remain asleep and may feel that they are suffering from insomnia. There is also a genetic element to insomnia and heritability estimates of insomnia vary between 38% in males and 59% in females. A genome-wide association study identified three genomic loci and seven genes 
that influence the risk of insomnia and show that insomnia is highly polygenic. In particular, a strong positive association was observed for the MSE1S1 gene in both males and females. The study showed that the genetic architecture of insomnia strongly overlaps with psychiatric disorders and metabolic traits. Risk factors have also been identified for insomnia. Insomnia affects people of all age groups, but people in the following groups have a higher chance of acquiring insomnia. If one is over 60, has a history of mental health disorders including depression and anxiety, emotional stress, working late night shifts, travelling frequently through different time zones, having chronic diseases such as diabetes, kidney disease, lung disease, Alzheimer's or heart disease, alcohol or drug use disorders, gastrointestinal reflux disease, heavy smoking or work stress. In medicine, insomnia is widely measured using the Athens Insomnia Scale. It's measured using eight different parameters related to sleep, and finally represented as an overall scale which assesses an individual sleep pattern. A qualified sleep specialist should be consulted for this diagnosis, so the appropriate measures can be taken. Past medical history and a physical examination need to be done to eliminate other conditions that could be the cause of the insomnia. After all conditions are ruled out and a comprehensive sleep history is taken, Sleep history should include sleep habits, medications, alcohol consumption, nicotine and caffeine intake, comorbid illnesses and sleep environment. And a sleep diary is often used to track the individual sleep pattern. This diary includes the time to go to bed, total sleep time, the time to sleep onset, number of awakenings, use of medications, time of awakening and subjective feelings in the morning. The diary can then be replaced or validated by the use of an outpatient actigraphy for a week or more using a non-invasive device that measures movement. There's not much treatment options for patients with insomnia. Instead, management options are put into place. It is recommended to rule out medical and psychological causes before we decide on treatment. Cognitive behavioural therapy is generally the first line of treatment once this, this elimination has been done. It has been found to be effective for chronic insomnia. The beneficial effects, in contrast to those produced by medications, may last well beyond the end of therapy. So, now that we've discussed insomnia, one of the most common forms and one of the most common well-known sleep disorders, I'll hand over to Shrey, who will be talking about sleep apnea. So, sleep apnea is one of the most common sleep breathing disorders. And it's characterised by your breathing stopping and starting as you sleep. So the most common type of sleep apnea is obstructive sleep apnea. And that's when the throat muscles relax during sleep and that causes your airways to become blocked. So if we look at symptoms, it's mostly the breathing starting stopping, gasping, choking or snorting noises if you wake wake up a lot in the night or a loud snoring and during the day there can be as with insomnia uh you can be very tired you can find it hard to concentrate you can have mood swings and you get a headache when you when you wake up and now obviously when you're asleep it's quite hard to uh, know that you have these symptoms but it, uh, if friends or family observe that you have this, these symptoms, it's important that you go and see, seek further help. So look at the causes. It's the airway becoming too narrow while you're sleeping, and that stops uh, you breathing properly. And sleep apnea is linked to um, certain other conditions such as obesity, uh, lo- having a large neck, being older, although younger children and younger adults can have it as well. Um, if it, if other family members has it, genetically you're more likely to have it. Uh, smoking and drinking alcohol as well, because alcohol is a depressant, so it will cause the, um, the throat muscles to relax and that causes the sleep apnea. Also, just having large tonsils. And also sleeping on your back is linked to having sleep apnea. So if you if your friends or family notice that you have this these symptoms or if you notice it somehow, maybe through a sleep tracker app, um, you should get a GP appointment and 
they if they think you have sleep apnea, they'll send you to a specialist sleep clinic. Um, they'll basically give you a machine that measures uh stuff like your heartbeat, your breathing, your brain activity, all your vital signs, all that kind of good stuff. And then from that, they will give you an AHI score. And so an AHI score of 5 to 14 means you have mild sleep apnea. 15 to 30 is moderate. And above 30 is severe sleep apnea. So if you have... um. If you have sleep apnea, there are a number of ways to treat it. So the most common, if you have a um, more um, moderate to severe, is with a CPAP machine, which is a constant positive airway pressure um, machine. And you might have seen these on the uh, COVID, on the news because of COVID, because like it's also been shown to be good at that. And if you have sleep apnea, you should be able to get a CPAP machine free on the NHS. And it pumps air into a mask, which is over your mouth and nose when you're sleeping. And it's just a, a machine that you keep by your bedside. And then you wear the mask as you sleep. And it, it stops the airways narrowing and should improve your quality of sleep. Alternatively, there's also a kind of mouthpieces like gum shields that hold air, the airway, airway open. And these are also called mandibular advancement devices. But these are less common. Um, CPAP is the most common. Um, there are also other things you can do if you're if it's more mild. So for example, you can lose weight. Obviously, obesity is a factor. Um, also, sleeping on your side is prefer for preferable to sleeping on your back because more air can get into your lungs and it's less obstructive. Um, to your breathing and to do that if you struggle the NHS recommends um, taping uh, a tennis ball to the back of your um, pajamas um, so that when you sleep you can't roll over onto your back uh, also not smoking uh, drinking less alcohol especially before you sleep and not taking sleeping pills unless they're prescribed by your doctors is very important and also sleep apnea can become more serious if it's not treated. Uh, it can lead to high blood pressure, which is associated with heart disease, uh, greater chance of stroke, atherosclerosis, uh, which we've covered in previous videos, can also lead to depression. And also it can lead to, uh, because of the tiredness, it can lead to accidents. Um, and particularly car accidents um, and actually that's why the DVLA which is the licensing agency in the UK for um, drivers and vehicles um, their guidance is if you have moderate or severe sleep apnea that's been diagnosed you must tell you must tell the DVLA uh, uh, that you have this uh, condition and you must not drive until you are free from excessive sleep fitness or other symptoms and there is a fine up to a thousand pounds for not disclosing um, conditions like this so just that to bear in mind as well furthermore to the tiredness thing there's also uh, your concentration at school or work and that also will have a negative effect on you so yeah so if you think you have sleep apnea a good way to measure it might be with a, a sleep tracker app. We'll be able to tell you. Uh, it'll record if you have very loud snoring or something like that. Or if anyone else in your household will probably notice if you've if you're got a loud snoring. So yeah, with all that being said, let's move on to Anna Pam, who's going to be talking about narcolepsy. So narcolepsy is one of those sleep disorders that is quite well known, but often quite misunderstood. I'm sure that a lot of people, when they first hear about narcolepsy, just remember it as, oh, that condition where people fall asleep all the time. But narcolepsy is actually a lot more serious than that. And there are other symptoms that significantly impact sufferers' lives because of it. Narcolepsy is a rare long-term brain condition 
that does cause a person to suddenly fall asleep at an inappropriate times. And it's found in roughly 30,000 people in the UK. It affects the brain's ability to regulate the normal sleep-wait cycle. If we take normal sleep, that is a regular pattern of REM and non-REM stages. And during a full night's sleep, every 90 minutes or so, a normal sleeper experiences several minutes of REM sleep, during which things such as dreaming occurs, before going back to non-REM sleep. However, with people with narcolepsy, the nocturnal sleep pattern is a lot more fragmented and typically involves numerous awakenings. When falling asleep at night or during the day, people with narcolepsy rapidly enter REM sleep, leading to unusual dreamlike phenomena such as hallucinations. People with narcolepsy also find it difficult to stay awake for long periods of time, regardless of the circumstances, and as such can have significant disruptions in their daily routine. So what are the direct symptoms of narcolepsy? Now, before I list these off, it must be noted that not everyone will have the same symptoms, and some people will have them regularly, whereas some people will have it much more infrequently. They can also develop slowly over a number of years, or suddenly over the course of just a few weeks. It is usually a chronic condition, and some of the symptoms might get better as you get older, but the usual symptoms include the following. Excessive daytime sleepiness, which is usually the first sign of narcolepsy and the most well-known one. And this has the biggest impact on everyday life. So this includes feeling drowsy throughout the day and struggling to stay awake, which does make it difficult to concentrate as well. Oftentimes this leads to people with narcolepsy being misjudged as lazy or rude, even though it's really not their fault. Another symptom is sleep attacks where you fall asleep suddenly and without warning, which is also very common in people with narcolepsy, and these can happen at any time. The length of time these attacks happen vary person to person, so some people can have micro-sleeps where it lasts a few seconds, whereas others can fall asleep for up to several minutes, and if not well controlled, sleep attacks can happen several times a day. Other conditions include sleep paralysis, so people with narcolepsy will wake up after sleeping, but still be unable to move or speak. This episode can last for a few seconds, up to several minutes again, and although it doesn't cause any harm to the body, so the person isn't actually paralysed, unlike what the name suggests, that experience of not being able to move can cause quite a lot of panic in people with narcolepsy, especially for their first few times of experiencing it. One of the most notable symptoms of narcolepsy is also cataplexy, which is sudden temporary muscle weakness or loss of muscular control. Cataplexy, cataplexy, is, cataplexy is uncontrollable and is triggered by intense emotions, usually positive ones such as laughter and excitement, but also sometimes fear, surprise or anger. Typical symptoms of cataplexy are the dropping of a jaw, slumping down of a head, legs collapsing, slurred speech, or double vision. And these attacks, as I said, are usually triggered by emotion. They can last, again, from a few seconds to several minutes, but during both mild and severe attacks, the person will stay fully conscious. It's just that they don't have control over their own muscles. These attacks can happen as infrequently as once or twice a year, whereas others can have them up to several times a day. And in an attempt to avoid these attacks, people sometimes become very emotionally withdrawn and socially isolated. Now, cataplexy is important because it helps classify the types of narcolepsy. Narcolepsy that occurs with cataplexy is called type 1, whereas narcolepsy that occurs without is called type 2. Around 75% of people with narcolepsy experience cataplexy, making it far more common to have type 1 narcolepsy, although type 2 is still an important minority. Cataplexy doesn't develop for months or years after the first signs of uh, narcolepsy, such as excessive daytime sleepiness, but in some very rare cases, it can be the first observed symptom. It is most severe when the person with narcolepsy is tired rather than fully alert, and it can end up leading to considerable anxiety. When cataplexy is present, it is almost a guaranteed diagnosis of narcolepsy, as it's extremely rare for it to be an isolated symptom. There are other rarer symptoms as well of narcolepsy, which I'm going to rattle through. So this can be hallucinations, so seeing or hearing things that aren't real, so auditory, visual, uh, even sometimes uh, nasal hallucinations. You can have memory problems, headaches, restless sleep. Uh, depression is also quite a big problem in people with narcolepsy. 
due to the constant stress on their life and also automatic behavior. So people will sometimes continue to do rote tasks that they do a lot, such as writing, typing, driving, even though they're asleep and they won't have any recollection of having done it afterwards. Now, this is very dangerous, especially in the case of driving. In terms of diagnosing narcolepsy, uh, it is quite a long process that involves the GP having to carry out several tests to rule out other conditions because the symptoms can be similar to those of other conditions. Sleep apnea, epilepsy, depression, hypothyroidism or previous head injuries could all have symptoms that overlap with narcolepsy. So in terms of narrowing it down to narcolepsy as a condition, it's usually recommended before you go see your doctor to record your symptoms in a diary or complete an Epworth sleepiness questionnaire. So the Epworth scale is an internationally accepted means of measuring daytime sleepiness, which is the major symptom of narcolepsy. When filling out the questionnaire, it asks the patient to rank the likelihood that they'll fall asleep in situations such as sitting, reading, watching TV, traveling as a passenger in a car. And if your score is 10 or below, this indicates a level of daytime sleepiness found in the general population, and there's no worries. But if you have a score of 18 or more, that indicates very marked daytime sleepiness and that the patient should seek urgent medical attention. Another useful source of data is a person's own sleep records. So a person might already or be asked to by their doctor to keep a detailed diary of their sleep pattern for a week or two. And this will be compared to uh, general sleep patterns that are known. And in addition to these sleep logs, doctors may ask you to wear an actigraph, which is a device that measures periods of activity and rest. Another key test used in diagnosis is a polysomnograph. So this test measures a variety of signals during sleep using electrodes placed all over your body. And for this test, you actually have to spend a night at a specialist sleep care medical facility. During the night when you're sleeping, several different parts of your body are monitored. So the test will measure the electrical activity of your brain via an electroencephalogram or EEG, your heart via an electrocardiogram or an ECG, the movement of your muscles via an electromyogram, and your eyes via an electrooculogram. It also monitors your breathing in the form of recording movements in your chest, abdomen, recordings of airflow through your mouth and nose, and pulse oximetry data, which is taken from your heart rate and blood oxygen levels. The polysomnography test basically takes all this data and collates it in a way that the doctor can make a confirmed diagnosis. Further tests also include taking a blood sample for analysis of your tissue type, there can also be a blood test to find out whether you have a specific genetic marker. This genetic marker, HLA-DQB star 0602, is associated with narcolepsy. And a positive result of having it does support a diagnosis, but it's not 100% certain. 30% of people without narcolepsy also have the genetic marker. Another test that is receiving increasing usage is by taking a sample of cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, um, from the spine during a lumbar puncture. And this is so they can measure the amount of hypocretin or orexin concentration. In subjects with narcolepsy, CSF hypocretin levels are generally greatly reduced and low hypocretin values are therefore a strong indicator of narcolepsy. This test is increasingly being used by sleep disorder specialists to help make their diagnoses. So what actually causes narcolepsy? Well, the exact cause is unknown, but people with type 1 narcolepsy, the most common type, have all proven to be shown to have low levels of the chemical hypocretin. It's an important neurochemical in your brain that regulates wakefulness and REM sleep, and when hypocretin levels are particularly low, people do experience cataplexy, another symptom of narcolepsy. Exactly what causes the loss of the hypocretin producing cells in the brain isn't known, but experts suspect it's due to an autoimmune reaction caused by the destruction of certain cells within the brain by the body's own immune system, those cells being responsible for the production of the hypocretin. It is generally not the case that narcolepsy runs in families, although the particular gene marker that I mentioned earlier can play a part in it, but this is more of a case of lower risk for people who do not have the gene, rather than higher risk for those who do have the gene. Research carried out in 2013 also found an association between the flu vaccine Pandemrix, which was used during the swine flu epidemic of 2009-10, and narcolepsy in children. 
While the risk was found to be very small, with the chance of developing narcolepsy after having a dose of the vaccine, estimated to be around 1 in 52,000, this did lead to pandemics no longer being used in the UK for flu vaccination. Narcolepsy can also be the result of an underlying condition that damages the areas of the brain that produces hypocretin. So narcolepsy can develop after the following, so a head injury, a brain tumour, multiple sclerosis or encephalitis. Narcolepsy resulting from these sort of conditions is called secondary narcolepsy. In terms of treatment and curing narcolepsy, there is no definitive cure for it, but there are several treatments that help control symptoms and effectively manage it. This includes having good sleeping habits, so part of that can be having planned naps, avoiding large meals which can induce sleep, sticking to a strict bedtime routine, relaxing before going to bed, having a good sleeping environment, and avoiding caffeine, alcohol, and smoking. Talking to others is another really big, important step in dealing with narcolepsy. It's quite a difficult condition to live with, but it can also be quite a difficult one for others to understand. Like I said earlier, a lot of people with narcolepsy just get labelled as lazy or un or very like tired all the time. There are obviously support groups all over the world, and in the UK, Narcolepsy UK is the main national narcolepsy support group who have really good information on their website. Medication-based treatments do exist, although they are not always available, uh, depending on your doctors and the region you live in, and also they are not always 100% effective. But these can include stimulants, such as dexamphetamine, methylphenandine, or pitolisant, which basically stimulates your central nervous system, helping keep you awake during the day. And these are usually taken every morning as tablets. Sodium oxybate, that's a medicine that helps improve your sudden loss of muscle control, which is obviously a symptom of cataplexy, and that can help sleep at night and also reduces daytime sleepiness, although it's not very commonly uh, prescribed. Antidepressants are also commonly described as, although they don't treat narcolepsy directly, they can help treat the symptoms such as sudden loss of muscle control, hallucinations, sleep paralysis, and also depression that can occur as a result of narcolepsy. Other things that are important to know about narcolepsy is that if you're in the UK and you have narcolepsy, your clinical team, when you're diagnosed, will pass information on to the National Congenital Anomaly and Rare Disease Registration Service, or NCARD-RS. Uh, this organisation helps scientists look for better ways to prevent and treat narcolepsy, although you can opt out of this register at any time. This register is also important for people with narcolepsy to access benefit services that they are entitled to. In terms of driving, you will need to complete a specific medical questionnaire so your individual circumstances can be assessed. In most cases, however, people with narcolepsy, if their condition is controlled and managed properly, they will be allowed to drive as normal, but there will be also regular reviews to assess your condition. So now that we've talked about this condition, I'm going to pass over to Sri, who's going to talk about parasomnias. So what are parasomnias? Parasomnia is a sleep disorder that involves unusual and undesirable physical events or experiences that disrupt your sleep. Parasomnia can occur before or during sleep or during arousal from sleep. If you have a parasomnia, you might have abnormal movements, talk or express emotions or do unusual things. There are different types of parasomnia. Parasomnias are grouped by the stage of sleep in which they happen. There are two main stages of sleep non-rapid eye movement sleep and rapid eye movement sleep uh, known as non-REM and REM respectively. There are other parasomnias that fall into another category as well. What is So now we're going to look at what non-rapid eye movement sleep is and what parasomnias happen during this sleep stage. Non-rapid eye movements non-rapid eye movement sleep is the first of the three stages of sleep from first falling asleep to about the first half of the night. Non-REM sleep disorders are also called arousal disorders. Non-REM parasomnias involve physical and verbal activity. You're not completely awake or aware during these events, are not responsive to others' attempts to interact with you, and you usually don't remember or only partially remember the event the next day. Non-REM parasomnias usually occur in individuals between the ages of 5 and 25 years of age, 
and non-REM parasomnias often occur in people who have a family history of similar parasomnias. So parasomnias that can happen during, during non-REM sleep include sleep terrors. So if you experience this sleep disorder, you wake up suddenly in a terrified state and these sleep terrors are usually brief for about 30 seconds but can also last up to a few minutes. And features of this disorder are racing heart rates, open eyes with dilated pupils and fast breathing and sweating. Sleepwalking can also occur and if you are a sleepwalker, you get out of bed, move about with your eyes wide open but you're usually asleep. You may mumble or talk, which is called sleep talking, but you may perform complex activities as well, such as driving or playing a musical instrument. And sleepwalking can be dangerous and lead to injuries because you're unaware of your surroundings. Additionally, you can also bump into objects or fall down. You could also be in states of confusion, confusional arousals. So if you have this sleep disorder, you appear to be partially awake, but you're confused and disorientated to the aspects of time and space so so what is a rapid eye movement sleep so REM sleep and what is um, parasomnias hap what parasomnias happen during this sleep stage so rapid eye movements which is REM sleep allows the three non REM stages of the sleep cycle during REM sleep your eyes rapidly move under your eyelids and your heart rate breathing and blood pressure all increased this is a time when vivid dreaming come, occurs. Your body cycles through and repeats non-REM and REM sleep about every 90 to 110 minutes. Parasomnias happen during the latter part of the night. If awakened during the event, it's likely you'd be able to recall part or all of the dream. Parasomnias that occur during REM sleep include nightmare disorder. So these are vivid dreams that cause feelings of fear, terror or anxiety and you may feel a threat to your survival or security. Next is recurrent isolated sleep paralysis. So if you have this sleep disorder you can't move your body or limbs during sleep and scientists think that paralysis, paralysis might be caused by an extension of REM sleep. Next is REM sleep behavior disorder and if you have this sleep disorder you can you act out, vocalize or make aggressive movements like punching or kicking as a reaction to a violent dream and this sleep disorder is more common among older adults as opposed to young children. Many people with this disorder have neuro neurogen ah. many people with this disorder have neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's and some other parasomnias include uh, exploding head syndrome. So if you have this sleep disorder you, you hear a loud noise or explosive crashing sound in your head as you fall asleep or wake up and you may also see an imaginary flash of light or have like a sudden muscle jerk. So parasomnias are seen more often in children who have neuro neurologic or psychiatric health issues including epilepsy, attention deficit, hyperactive disorder which is ADHD or developmental issues. So what are the actual causes of parasomnias. So the causes of parasomnias can be grouped into those that disturb sleep and other general health issues. So issues that disturb sleep include incomplete transition from being awake to the stages of sleep and a lack of it, lack of sleep, irregular sleep waking schedules, for example due to jet lag jet lag or changes in work shifts and medications that can cause this disorder can include benzodiazepines and medication used to treat depression or medication used to treat uh, psychotic disorders. Uh, those that treat high blood pressure may also trigger these, trigger the disorder. And medical issues that disturb sleep such as uh, restless leg syndrome or obstructed sleep apnea and pain. Other health issues include fever, stress, alcohol, substance abuse and may also extend to head injury, pregnancy or genetics. So what are the symptoms of parasomnia? Oh. So now let's look at the symptoms of parasomnias. So each type of parasomnia has many unique features and triggers. 
However, some of the more common symptoms include difficulty sleeping through the night, waking up confused or disorientated, and being tired during the day, and finding cuts and bruises on your body for which you don't remember the cause of. So now let's look at the diagnosis and testing that is involved in parasomnias. So let's first look at how parasomnias are diagnosed. Your sleep medicine specialist will ask you and any potential members that are affected by parasomnia about your symptoms. You also need to be asked about your medical history, family history, alcohol use and any substance abuse. You will be asked about your current medications and you may be asked to keep a sleep diary and your and your family members may be asked to keep track of your sleep events. Other sleep disorder tests include a sleep study and this is a sleeping laboratory in which you will be monitored as you sleep. Your brain waves, heart rate, eye movement and breathing will be recorded as you sleep. Video will record your movements and behavior. While some people uh, let me do that again. Video will be recorded of your movements and behavior. While some sleep studies can be done at home, an in-lab study will be recommended if there's concern for parasomnia. Sleep ECGs are also another test. These tests help help your healthcare provider to see and record your brain activity during a brain event. A neurological exam such as a CT or MRI scan may also be used to detect degeneration of the brain or other possible neurological causes of your symptoms. So how is parasomnia treated? So treatments start with identifying and treating other sleep problems and any other health issues as well as reviewing medications that may trigger the parasomnia as discussed previously. General management strategies for both non-REM and REM sleep disorders are to follow good sleeping habits so to get about nine, seven to nine hours of sleep and turn off lights, TV and electronic devices and keep room temperature cool. Avoid caffeine and strenuous exercise near bedtime as well. And it's also important to maintain your regular sleep waking schedule and having a consistent bedtime and wake up time, even though this may be difficult with shift work. Uh, so limit or don't use alcohol recre recreational drugs and taking all prescribed med medications as directed by your healthcare provider is also very important. So, in terms of safety precautions regarding, uh, let me start that bit again. So, with regards to safety precautions concerning parasomnia, so you should ensure that you lock or remove any dangerous or sharp items from bedrooms, secure table side lights, use floor pads to prevent injuries from fall, from falls, and pad the edges of bedside furniture. So finally, let's look at how you can prevent. So, so finally, let's look at how parasomnias can be prevented. Although some causes of parasomnias are less likely to be prevented, such as those due to neurological diseases, mental health issues, or hereditary, others may be prevented by following some of the same management approaches discussed. These include getting seven to nine hours of sleep and sticking with consistent bed times and wake up times. So also asking your healthcare provider to review your current medications is also very important and many medications can disturb your sleep as discussed previously and if this is the case perhaps different drugs can be prescribed. So hopefully you've gained a good insight into parasomnias and now back to Adrian. So I hope throughout today's episode you've gained much knowledge about the different types of sleep disorders, how they affect people's lives, their symptoms, treatments, and how they can be recognised early on so that they can be treated and managed well. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of Medisodes, and remember to like, subscribe, and share with anyone who'd be interested.